Patient song tonight will be 109. We'll sing this after Bible class and the invitation this evening, 109. We'll start with 169. Be our opening song. We'll sing the first and third verses. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to gather today with those of like precious faith to consider thy word and to sing these songs before thy throne. To be with our Christian family tonight, Father, may we edify one another, build each other up in the most holy faith. Father, we pray for Chad that he would deliver the lesson in this class and all the classroom teachers downstairs, that they have prepared themselves in such a way that each student may be built up. Father, we're so thankful for this season that we can gather with family and loved ones. We pray, Father, for safety as our members travel this holiday season. Father, we know that those who are sick and those who are bereaved, we pray that you would be with them this week. Father, as thy servants, may we seek out opportunities to be a blessing unto each one. Father, continue with us through this hour of study. May we prepare our minds and our hearts to receive the lessons we'll learn tonight. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Good evening. We welcome you here this evening, midweek, to the Bremen Church of Christ for our Bible study. Thankful for everyone's presence. We do have some traveling, but we have some that came to take their places, and we're thankful for that. Welcome our visitors this evening. We're dismissed now with our nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. and the middle school and high school classes. There's a visitor we hadn't had in a while. Hey, Scott. <laughs> some folks home for Christmas. Some folks uh, in town visiting. All these preachers show up again. Makes me uh, makes me just want to turn it over to somebody. But uh, it's good to have good to have Austin and Brandon here. I was worried to death, uh, Austin. I, I saw uh, some of Kelly uh, Pitsley's family from Valdosta. They were passing through, and I was uh, I was saying something about how Austin had been here, and I I made a statement, and I, I was just I was afraid it came out the wrong way. Sometimes you say something, you say, "Boy, I don't, somebody might have taken that the wrong way." But I had said something to the congregation here that Austin was in my youth group up there in Dalton, and uh, that I just never would have guessed that he'd have made a preacher. <laughs> And I didn't mean that to sound like I didn't think he knew the Bible or 
Uh, it was just he was quiet. He, he, would, he would sit in class, and he was always very well behaved, but he was just quiet. And so I just never would have picked him out on account of that to be a preacher. Not because I thought he was a dummy or anything, but I just I got home that night and I told Reagan, I said, you know, I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't come across like I thought he didn't, didn't know the Bible or, or wouldn't do a good job preaching or something. But anyway, it's good to have Austin here and uh, Miss Ansley and Brother Mike as well, his parents. Um, I mentioned before that uh, Levi, when he was about, I guess, about Noah's age, uh, he, he wouldn't talk to anybody. We we just you know tell him you know now be nice and he'd threaten him saying that don't be rude Levi but he'd always just, just put his head down he wouldn't talk to anybody and uh, but but he loved Miss Ansley and so uh, good good to see them tonight as well we are we're talking we began our study last week on the the book Thy Kingdom Come by David Farm we're looking at the the second chapter of that and hope to cover that tonight and and we'll. Um, talk about confusing theories is, is what the name of this second chapter is. <clears throat> there's, there's an idea among some folks that, that we want to talk about at the beginning. And, you, you know, I, I say this a lot, that, that, you know, life and spirituality are about balance. And, and it's very difficult sometimes to achieve balance. Some people are more balanced than others. Uh, some folks tend toward extremism one way or the other. Uh, sometimes you will see uh, a, a brother in Christ even sometimes that will be so very conservative. You know, we, we use the expression so straight-laced you bend over backwards. Uh, but then that brother will sometimes swing to the other extreme and go off into uh, very liberal thinking. Uh, sometimes it will be the exact opposite of that. Someone will go from very liberal thinking into uh, very strict radicalism. Uh, but, you know, sometimes people tend toward extremes. <clears throat> there's, there's, you know, the extreme that some folks have that, they want to go out and find something wrong with everything and everybody. Uh, that is not only a miserable existence, that it's, it's not biblical. But, but that's an extreme that sometimes people have. And we need to be careful about that. But the other extreme that sometimes people get into is, you know, why do you ever say anything? Uh, why do you talk about premillennialism? Or why do you talk about this ism or that ism? Why, what, what's... You know, just leave people alone. If that's what they believe and they're convinced of that, then why even fool with that? Uh, you know, it's the idea that you're picking on somebody. Uh, well, that's another extreme that's equally wrong. The Bible does say, uh, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but what? Try the spirits. Or some versions say, test the spirits, whether they are of God. And he goes on and tells us why. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And so it is a biblical thing to to oppose error, to expose religious error. Now, again, we don't want to get to the extreme where that's all we ever do. And that's, that's certainly a wrong extreme. But the extreme of saying, oh, I'm never going to do that or never going to address those things, that would be equally wrong. And so when we talk about these things, I want to understand, and we're not just trying to go about picking out anything and everything wrong that we can find or uh, you know, nitpick and things like that, but this is such a widespread doctrine. This concept of premillennialism and, and all that, it's so widespread, it's so commonly taught and believed that it needs to be addressed. And, and then, of course, you have things like the movie that's just come out and, and people start asking questions, say, well, what about this, this uh, concept of being left behind? Is that biblical and how much of that's true, how much of that's not true? And so these are, uh, these are good things to talk about in light of that, but just by virtue of the fact that we are told to test the spirits. So I wanted to mention that because we can get off on either extreme, and either extreme is, is equally wrong. And so we want to try to approach it from a balanced perspective. We're not just trying to look for fault and nitpick, but at the same time, we're going to examine this doctrine in light of the Word of God and see what, what, does it, what does the Bible teach. As far as confusion over, over last things, you know, we, we've mentioned this already, but there, there are a few things that create as much uh, speculation, or at least lead to greater speculation than the subject of the end of time. Uh, it is amazing, and maybe it's because uh, understanding that the end of time is, is just that. It's the end of time, the end of this earth as we know it, and maybe that's why it leads to such fantastical speculation that you hear from some folks, but it is, uh, it is a fact that you want to get some people off on a wild tangent, get them talking about the end of time. But that's not new to our day and age as far as error being out there, 
regarding the end of time. It was around in, in the first century as well. Uh, let me get somebody, if you would, read 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. Who wants to read? Brother Gary? Scott, you feel like reading scripture for me? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. I'll get you to read that after Gary reads. 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, please. And their message was spread, spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus of this sort, who have straight concerned this truth, saying that the resurrection is already past and that they overthrow, overthrow the faith of some. I hear these two men, they were overthrowing the faith of some. They were saying the resurrection was past already. So there, there's a false doctrine regarding end time things, the resurrection of the dead. And so, you know, even back then, they had those who taught error on this subject. Scott, Second uh, Thessalonians 2, verse 2, please. Don't be troubled by a letter as if from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Uh, you know, he wrote 1 Thessalonians. It seemed that some of them, perhaps indicated by chapter 2, verse 2 of 2 Thessalonians, got the idea, well, <clears throat> somebody came along teaching them, hey, it, it's coming. So, you know, you need to stop working. You need to sell your possessions, that kind of thing. And so Paul writes 2 Thessalonians. He's going to clear up some things for them. So, you know, again... False ideas pertaining to the end of time have been around for a, a long, long time. There's a lot of imagination out there when it comes to people teaching about the end of time. There's a lot of sensationalism when it comes to this subject. Unfortunately, many times when you hear people talk about it, there's a lot of sensationalism, a lot of imagination, and yet very little scripture. And that's what you're going to find a lot of times with some of these folks uh, there's a lot of misapplication and misrepresentation of it when they do use Scripture. But we want to make sure that when we're studying this subject, we're not misapplying Scripture. We're not misrepresenting Scripture. We want to bring in what does the Bible say, stand on that, and make sure we apply that right. Rightly dividing the word, as Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, but it's interesting because even those who are very, very devoted to particular theories of millennialism, many times... They're apt to be confused concerning the details of it. Uh, sometimes, I mean, not, I'm not even trying to be, uh, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, antagonistic towards someone. But I've had sometimes people will start talking to me about premillennialism. And I'll, I'll get them talking sometimes just, just to keep, the, keep that conversation going and say, okay. Uh, they'll say, you know, hey, uh, the, the signs are there and the rapture's coming. I say, uh, the rapture, huh? Yeah, 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 it's coming. I say, well, what are the signs that, that you talk about? You said the signs are there. I'd say, you know. So sometimes they'll start talking about that and say, but, uh, all right, well, so what, what's, but if they're raptured, what happens to all the bad people? Oh, they're left out here and there's going to be a tribulation. All right, and, and then what, what after that? Well, just gonna, the Lord's going to come back and he's going to bring his saints with him. So, so wait a minute. I'm, if I'm righteous, I go to heaven, but then I got to leave heaven and come back to earth? And then sometimes even talking to people, they'll say, well, no, um, I think, but let me, that doesn't sound right, does it? And I'll say, no, it doesn't sound right. You know, sometimes even people that believe the, the millennial doctrines, the various flavors of it, if you will, they get confused by some of the details. And so you're going to see that as we go along, and I, I'm trying, I try as much as I can, and we're going to look at some slides in a moment to try to get it as simple as possible because some of it gets downright complicated. And, and I, I have said all along, uh, or for a long time, and I believe it, and I believe the Bible teaches it, that you don't have to be a scholar or a rocket scientist, as we sometimes say, to understand the Bible. When people start getting theories that are so convoluted and complicated, something's wrong. Because God's giving us a book. He's given us revelation that we can understand. That doesn't mean that it's not going to require some study. But when it comes to life and salvation, how to go to heaven when this life is over, we can understand that. And it's not going to be so confusing. Most agree that Christ will come again, but, but there are questions. And some of this is what we're going to deal with. Some of this, maybe not necessarily tonight, but in the weeks to come in this study. But here are some questions that a lot of people have about the second coming of Christ. Is his coming imminent? Is it at hand? Is it going to happen soon, in other words? A lot of folks have that question. A lot of folks believe that it is. But you know, a lot of folks have believed that it is for hundreds of years. 
And, and so that's a question that people have. Is, is his coming you know, near at hand? Will there be a rapture? People ask that question. What is meant by the thousand years? That's another question people are asking. Who is the Antichrist? People are asking that all the time. I uh, mentioned, you know, being up in Dalton, this, this was, um, I don't know, Austin, you might have been in that class, but uh, one, of the, one of the last classes I taught up there before we moved away, on a Wednesday night, we were in there, and one of the kids were asking me uh, about, uh, they were actually asked me about President Obama. They said, is he the Antichrist? And so we, we were talking about that and answering, people have that question. Now, anytime, a, a, whether it's, it might be an entertainment person who's well-known or might be a political figure, might be somebody, you know, in another country, political figure, people start saying, you know, if they do something really, really wicked, people start saying, is, is that the Antichrist? And so people have that question, who is the Antichrist? We, we've already noticed, not to, not to give away uh, the answer, but there is no the Antichrist. It's a, it's a description. It's not meant to describe one particular person. It could be anyone who is anti or against Christ and his teaching. Uh, question that people are asking, do the Jews have a special role in the future? Well, that's a big question. We've had presidents base their entire foreign policies on premillennial doctrine. I, I believe it, in my, somebody help me out. Was it Nixon? Carter. It was Carter that, that was, I mean, uh, big time foreign policy based on the idea that that land belongs to the Jews. So everybody else better be hands off. Now, you know, I'll be the first to tell you, for obvious reasons, I don't want Muslims to take over that land and have free reign of it. Just because they, they tend to hurt people that won't convert to Islam. They want, you know, tribute of the swords, kind of the expression that, that used to be popular among them. So I don't want that. But it's not because the land belongs to Israel. It doesn't. You know, that, that's, you know, we, we talked about this before. The Israel now is the church, the spiritual Israel. But, it, but again, all that's getting ahead of ourselves. And people sometimes ask the question, how many resurrections will there be? We've talked about this a little bit last week. We'll talk about it more in the weeks to come. These are all just questions that people are asking. Uh, as far as the millennium. We're going to talk about different theories of millennialism in, in our class tonight and, and analyze them a little bit better. But the beginning place for a lot of folks concerning the end of time is, is usually in various interpretations of Revelation chapter 20. So let's, let's go there. Revelation chapter 20. There's, they're especially wanting to figure out what is meant by the millennium here, the thousand, the thousand year period. Um, now, where else, where are the other places in the Bible where we read about the millennium? Brother Allen's shaking his head. Why? There aren't any. There is no other place. Isn't it amazing that people develop and base so much of a doctrine and of, of their belief on the end of time on one single mention of this in Scripture? Now, not to say that that lessens it. If God only said in one place that you must, you must be baptized into Christ in order to have your sins washed away, well, that'd be sufficient. If God only said in one place that you had to do this or do that, in order to be saved and be right with him and go to heaven, that'd be sufficient. I'm not taking away from that. But it's one place in the Bible, and it's in a book that tells you in the beginning and in the end of the book that it is a highly figurative book. And yet people go to this one passage in a highly figurative book, and they say, there it is, the millennium. And now I know what's going to happen at the end. Isn't that... Doesn't that strike us as a little bit odd, a little bit counterproductive to understanding this whole subject? But this is where people go. Look, look at Revelation 20. Let me get somebody, if you don't mind, just, just read verses. Uh, let's just read verses 1 to 6. Or we'll go, go on and read verses 1 to 7. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years. 
And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. All right, let's go ahead and stop at six. I was going to go into seven, but that, that's talking about after the thousand years. So there's your, your mention of the millennium, the thousand year period, uh, here in Revelation 20, verses one to six. Uh, again, amazing that in this highly figurative book, people make this interpretation, their interpretation of the millennium here, the basis for so much, how they see so much in the rest of the Bible. And that's, again, that's counterproductive, and that's not the way that we need to be uh, studying the Bible. Those who see the text as a prophecy of yet future events seem to assume that they have unquestioned ability to interpret what they see as unfulfilled prophecy. And sometimes you find that with folks uh, even to this day. But the, the doctrines concerning millennialism are generally classified, and we've talked about this a little bit already, as post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, and amillennialism. Uh, post-millennialism is the idea that Christ's second coming will be after the millennium. Premillennialism is the idea that his second coming will be before the millennium. And then amillennialism is the idea basically not accepting either one. Not, that's not that, you know, A, a means not. Uh, like, you know, theism is a belief in God. Atheism is not believing in God at all. So it, it almost feels wrong to call it amillennialism because I would be characterized as an amillennialist. But it's not that I reject. I mean, clearly there's a millennium in Revelation 20, right? I, I just reject that it is a literal 1,000 years. I think it's a figurative, symbolic 1,000 years. And so that's what typically you're going to see with amillennialists. I don't know of anybody who would be characterized as an amillennialist who says, nope, there is no 1,000-year period at all. You can't deny that. It's right there in the text. It's just not a literal 1,000 year period that either Christ is going to come before that 1,000 years or after that 1,000 years. That's, that would be the amillennial position. All right, let's talk a little bit more about postmillennialism. Um, postmillennialism doesn't interpret the millennium necessarily as a literal 1,000 year period. They, they hold it as being a long period of, of righteous peace and prosperity before Christ comes again. We've talked about this just a little bit. Uh, they don't believe necessarily everybody, every single person will be converted to Christ, but the world generally will become Christianized before Christ's second coming. They also correctly understand that the coming of Christ will be without warning, and that's what postmillennialism teaches. They recognize there will be one resurrection of the dead. And this is where you see a lot of difference between pre- and postmillennialism. Uh, Premillennialism says, oh, there are lots of signs of when he's going to come. Postmillennialism says, no, no signs. It's going to come without warning. Premillennialism says there's going to be, uh, depending on which premillennialism you hold to, two, three, sometimes even, I believe there's, I've heard of versions that have four resurrections. Uh, but uh, again, postmillennialism says one resurrection of the dead. Uh, they believe the world will be destroyed and final judgment will occur at that time. They generally, postmillennialism generally does not insist on a rigid and detailed theology. It tends to be, you know, and you see that hopefully in, in just what we're discussing here. But, but here's the thing, just summing all that up. Postmillennialism, number one, is not nearly as popular as the premillennial position. Uh, in fact, before studying this particular book, I don't know, I mean, I'm, we talked about it in school, but I don't know that I'd really had much encounter with postmillennialism. But the bottom line is that, that idea that before Christ comes, there's going to be a long period of you know, righteous peace and prosperity. It doesn't fit with what we talked about last week in the parable of the wheat and tares. Remember? 
Because Jesus says, the householder, which is God, he says, let the wheat and the tares grow together. The harvest is the end of the world. They grow together until the harvest. There's wheat, there's tares, they're growing together. At the end of time, then they're separated. So that automatically rules out uh, post-millennialism right there. We know that's, uh, that's not correct. Now, premillennialism. Uh, this, this is the idea of holding to a literal interpretation of the thousand years in Revelation 20. Every, you know, this is, my disclaimer for this is that when I say premillennialism teaches that, fill in the blank, I'm talking about generally because there are so many different varieties of it that one group may say, no, that's not what we believe. And another group over here say, well, that, yeah, absolutely, that's what we believe. And there might even be a third group that says, we don't believe uh, either, either one of those things. Here's something totally different. But by and large, they say the, the, the thousand years in Revelation 20, absolutely, literal, dead on 1,000 year period. That's what they would say. Uh, they believe that that 1,000 years is, is a time, going to be a time of peace and perfection on earth. Uh, we, we talked about this. Uh, we looked at a, a passage in Isaiah a while back where even, even wild animals are going to be tamed, you know. There's no mention of the second coming in the text. Premillennialism assumes the second coming in Revelation 20 because that would have to be in order to, uh, Jesus would have to return in order to establish his millennial kingdom here on this earth because they believe it's going to be on this earth. And we're going to sum this up in just a moment. Uh, but during the millennium, he's going to literally rule on earth. Uh, the world will not be destroyed when he comes. The final judgment won't happen until a thousand years later after he comes. Beginning with this view of Revelation 20, premillennialism then goes on and, and develops elaborate and complicated theories that involve almost every aspect of Bible doctrine. Every Old Testament prophecy is colored if you're a premillennialist. You, you have to have a different look at every single Old Testament prophecy. Anything to do with the church, that's, we'll talk, you'll see that in just a moment, how, how, what a difference that makes. Um, even among the premillennialists, there are a lot of disagreements over the sequence of events. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, so-called Mormons, uh, these, these groups, they have their own particular twists on millennial theology. But the most popular form of premillennial theology, and this is what we're going to spend most of our time looking at in this class, uh, you know, post-millennialism is almost going to fall by the wayside because it's, it's not as popular. The most popular doctrine, even variety of premillennialism, is dispensational premillennialism. Uh, this is what's popularized in, in the movies such as the Left Behind series. Hal, uh, is it Hal Lindsey that wrote, is that right, Brandon? Hal Lindsey, uh, Late Great Planet Earth. Maybe you've heard of that. That popularized it as well. Um, Somebody asked me, I think it was a couple weeks ago, we were talking about where, where did it come from. This, this goes back to the early 1800s. Uh, pre, dispensational premillennialism, they, they arbitrarily divide man, God's dealings with man into seven dispensations or periods of, of time. There's nothing wrong with the, the term dispensation. We, we often talk about the mosaic dispensation. We talk about the patriarchal dispensation. We currently are living in the Christian dispensation. That's a biblical concept. But they just, this dispensational theology just arbitrarily picks these dispensations and then they start forming a doctrine around it. It's sometimes it's called pre-tribulationism. Maybe you've heard that. Uh, the idea that God's people are going to be raptured before or pre-tribulation, before the great tribulation. Uh, sometimes people will even specify it as pre-tribulation, pre-millennialism. Uh, I think they just want to make it as difficult to say as possible. <laughs> That's, the more you say these words, the more difficult they get, the more chance of getting tongue-tied. Dispensationalism, go, though, goes back somewhere around the time of John Darby, early 1800s. Uh, he was a leader of Plymouth Brethren denomination. There, there's little or no evidence of, of this, this theology prior to the, somewhere around that time. Uh, the, the proponents of the theory ex, ex, explain this by saying that uh, God's given them special insight to understand the Bible as none before. That's why you never read about it before. They have special insight. Well, we know better than that from other passages in the Bible. One of them being we already talked about, 1 John 4, 1. Test the prophets, whether they are of God. But credit for wide dissemination of dispensationalism goes in large part. I think you could probably list a number of different sources, but one of the major sources is the Schofield Bible. Uh, it's, uh, what's his name? C.I. Schofield, 1843 to 1921. 
put out this Schofield Reference Bible. It was per first published in 1909. Circulation numbers are in the millions. Uh, it is the standard Bible text, but there are footnotes uh, throughout, uh, and there are very dogmatic dispensational premillennialist footnotes. Uh, in fact, a lot of folks seem to accept the notes on an equal plane with the Word of God. Uh, of course, that's very dangerous. I tell people it's great to have a Bible with some good notes in it. Um, what's the other one? Somebody, anybody got one? Of, is, it, is it Nelson Study Bible? Is that what I'm trying to think of? Does anybody have one of those? A lot of good study notes in that. Uh, Dixon, that's what I was trying to think of. Dixon Bible has some good study notes in it. But there are even some premillennial notes in the Dixon Bible. So any, anything that's put out by men, you have to understand just that. It's, it's put out by men. It's not the infallible word of God. So I want to just sum up a little bit of the, try to, try to get it into a nutshell here. If I can get my clicker to work. There we go. Uh, the promise, th these are highlights of uh, dispensational premillennialism. What is going on with this crazy thing? I know it's not the batteries. We changed the batteries just a few weeks ago. All right. Highlights of dispensational premillennialism. Uh, and I've got my disclaimer on the next slide here that these, these are highlights of dispensational premillennialism do not represent the biblical view because I'm, I'm bringing it into a nutshell here so I'm not going to, every single bullet point's not going to say, they say that. Uh, so just understand this is not my position, obviously. It's not the biblical position. But the promise to David, 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. Uh, let me get somebody, if you would, look that up and read that for us. I don't have it on the screen. They're going to say this refers to a restored earthly kingdom in Jerusalem with Christ on David's throne. Uh, we, we looked at this passage uh, a little bit just, uh, I don't know, what, three or four months ago? It was our book of the month, 2 Samuel. Who's got it? Robert, go ahead, please. All right, so he says, I'm going to establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He's talking to David. I'm going to establish your, your kingdom. Let me get over here. I'm trying to find a spot where I can see better. Um, so they, they say, premillennialism says, that this is going to be a restored earthly or political kingdom. You're going to have Jesus sitting on David's throne, literally, in Jerusalem, ruling. Supposedly, he came to establish such the first time he came to earth, but it was postponed due to rejection. We talked about this a few weeks ago, so some of this is more familiar to us. Uh, the cross and the church never prophesied in the Old Testament, if you believe dispensational premillennialism. Now, who can believe that? The cross, the Lord's church, is it any wonder that many folks who hold to this theology have such a low esteem and view of the church? It's not the bride of Christ. It's not eternally in the plan of God, Ephesians 3, 10, 11, Ephesians 5, and other passages. It's just a substitute. You, but you, you cannot read the New Testament and come away, if you're, if you're reading it and taking it at face value, with the idea that the church is just a substitute, that it's just plan B. But that's the dispensational view. They were never prophesied in the Old Testament. All those prophecies that you and I would look at and say, that's prophecy of the church. You know, Daniel 2.44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. I said, that's the kingdom of David. That's right here. 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. It's a political kingdom. Christ on David's throne in Jerusalem. That's, that's what a, a dispensationalist would say. Kingdom prophecies are postponed until the second coming. So, so you know, you say, well, so, so Daniel 2.44 is about a literal kingdom on earth. Yes, they would say. So are you just saying it's wrong? They say, no, I'm just saying it's postponed. You ever hear people talk about the postponement theory? Uh, that's what they'll be talking about, is this idea that these kingdom prophecies are postponed. Now, you can see that there... I'm trying to approach this in a balanced way to see that, you know, people aren't going to just say, well, yeah, no, I don't believe those prophecies were accurate. They said, no, they're postponed. But you can still see 
hopefully just common sense, and if not, we'll, we'll examine these a little bit more in depth as we go along this study. That, that's just kind of what we say back home, dancing around the truth. It's very obvious if God prophesied and said it's going to happen in the days of these kings, postponement's not getting it. Does God know what's going on? We talked about this before. If they rejected him the first time, who's to keep him? What's to keep him from rejecting him the second time? You see, there, there's, there's all kind of problems here that you can't answer if you're going to believe in this dispensational theory. They would go on and say that the present age in which we're living, the church age, is a parenthesis between the first coming of Christ when he was unable to establish his kingdom and the second coming when he will sit on David's throne for a thousand years. So we're just kind of living in a parenthesis. Uh, yeah, that just kind of sounds rather blah, <laughs> unimportant, doesn't it? And yet, looking at the Bible, and when we start to understand scriptures in their context, we're not living in a parenthesis. We are living in, if we are Christians, the kingdom of God. What a great blessing that is. You, you see what a different view of the church you have if you have this dispensational view. Then they go on to talk about signs of his coming. The idea is that all the signs must, uh, that must occur before his coming, they've already happened. All these signs are happening, and they have happened, and so that means, uh, well, first of all, the assumption is that there are signs at all. That they're assuming that there are signs for his coming. This is misinterpreted from such passages in Matthew 24. We already noticed that last week, that if Jesus in Matthew 24 is giving signs, and he's discussing in the entire chapter the end of time, then you have a rather contradictory two halves of that chapter. Jesus says, here are all the signs. Oh, by the way, there are no signs. You, you, you don't know. It's going to be just like in the days of Noah. Uh, so either he's giving a completely contradictory statements there, or he's talking about two different things. And of course he is. He's, he's giving signs to point toward the end of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The second half of the chapter is talking about the second coming, and he says there are no signs. So they assume that there are signs, but it's, it's impossible to know the exact time they would admit, but they say it's imminent. It's at hand. It's going to happen soon. Thus, the rapture has to be the next event in the divine scheme of things. All the other signs have come to pass. And, and I had someone who was a dispensationalist explain this to me one time because I didn't quite get that part. But they say all the other signs have happened. Next in the list is the rapture. And that's what they would say. Now, again, I've talked to other dispensationalists who say, oh, no, there are other signs. And they're going to come to pass and then that'll be leading up to the rapture. But there are other signs that still have to be fulfilled. Those will be fulfilled. Then the rapture. Again, it just depends on who you talk to. Generally speaking, though, they say the rapture is the next event in the divine scheme. Particular interest, of course, is given to the establishment of the modern nation of Israel, which is said to be a fulfillment of prophecy. They say, there you go. That's uh, setting up for them to own that land and take it over. Then, of course, there's the rapture, which is common to dispensationalism. It's a secret coming of Christ known only to the faithful, unseen, unheard by the masses. Unless you are a faithful child of God, you don't know. And if you're a faithful child of God, then you're, you're raptured and taken with the Lord. Uh, the resurrection of the righteous dead, but not the unrighteous dead. The righteous dead are given resurrection bodies at this time. This will be the first, they, they say this is the first resurrection of Revelation 20, verses 5 and 6. All the saints are going to meet him in the air and be with him for seven years. Some people say it's in heaven. Some say, well, I'm not sure. I just know it's going to be with Christ. And, and I think some folks have seen that there's a, uh, there's, there's a problem there that you have to deal with because if Jesus comes and takes all the saints and raptures them to heaven, only seven years later to say, hey, everybody, I know I told you we were going to come here and we were going to ever be with the Lord, but we got to go back to earth. We've got business to take care of down there. Uh, that's a problem. And that doesn't jive with other scriptures. So some folks say, well, no, we're not going to be in heaven. We'll just be somewhere with Christ. Well, you know, that's, that's, and some of them will even say, I don't know where. But that's the idea that we're going to meet him in the air if we're saints, be with him for seven years somewhere. Don't know for sure where. During the rapture period, there's judgment for the righteous. They're assigned their rewards. But again, you have a problem if you say that they're going to heaven, even if you, don't, if you say they don't go to heaven. They've been assigned their reward, but there's still more to come, so, you know, it's, it's just not, it's not final, as, as they would say. But that's the idea. Next in that scheme, uh, in this scheme of dispensationalism, is the Great Tribulation. Seven years after the rapture. The raptured are with Christ. 
Some people assign the worst aspect of this to the last half of the seven years. That's when the great part of the great tribulation is. There's, there's uh, some of them who figure out what has happened. They're going to convert to Jesus. Dispensationalists give a, a particular amount of attention to the Jews. And again, we talked about that just a moment ago. They believe the Jews are going to come to believe in Jesus en masse. And they're just going to, some, some folks even say they're just going to migrate by the masses to Jerusalem and to the Palestine area. Prior to and during the tribulation, the Jews will be restored to Palestine. They'll look to the Antichrist as a great benefactor, only to figure out, whoops, he's not a benefactor. He's a mean person. He's the Antichrist, and he's going to seek to exterminate them. Uh, you, you see some of the sensationalism here. You, you, you just can't find this stuff in the Bible. Uh, but this, this is what they're teaching. Uh, the Antichrist is going to marshal world powers against them for a final battle. They're going to gather together at Armageddon and there's going to be this great showdown with the Antichrist. And then, of course, you have the Battle of Armageddon. At the end of the seven years, just in time, here comes Christ again. This is the second phase or the second stage of his second coming. You see, the, the dispensationalists understand and, and have, or at least many of them have had it pointed out to them, the Bible says there's just a second coming of Christ. And they say, well, yeah, but there's a phase one and a phase two. I say, what? Where, where do you read this? There is no, nothing in your New Testament that says phase one of the second coming, phase two of the second coming. It's not second coming part A, part B. It just says second coming. And so you see this, again, it just, um, look, looking at this just in a balanced way, it's not, it just, you just cannot explain this biblically. But then they say the raptured saints are going to be brought back to earth. So that's when Jesus says, all right, it's time for us to all go back to earth. And so off they go. Then there's, uh, they say the first time he came for his saints, now he comes with his saints. And we'll look at this in depth when we talk more about the rapture. The Antichrist and his forces are going to be defeated at Armageddon. There will also be a second resurrection of the dead. Those who died during the tribulation who had converted to Christ, but still not any unsaved dead. So this puts us at three resurrections now. This is the second. First one was the righteous dead. Second one, righteous dead who died during the tribulation. Third resurrection will be the unrighteous dead. Uh, but again, you just don't find that in the New Testament. And then, of course, there's the period of the millennium, Christ reigning on David's throne in Jerusalem. The Jews will have a special place in the millennium with Gentile believers in a subordinate position. It's ironic to me that the people teaching this are Gentiles. They're non-Jewish people. But they say that, hey, we're going to be in a subordinate position. I, I, to this day, I've never had anybody explain to me how they come up with that other than just looking at Old, Old Testament scriptures where uh, God has a special attention given to the nation of Israel. But even there, it's not because Israel is better than other nations. Moses made it very clear to them in the book of Deuteronomy, God didn't choose you because you're better or because you're stronger, but God chose you because of the promise to Abraham. And so, you know, maybe they're basing it on passages where it talks about the Jew first and also the Greek, uh, but that's not talking about priority, that's just talking about the order. The gospel went to the Jew first, then to the Greek. Yes, sir? Was Paul confused about that whenever he said that neither the Jew nor the Greek was bond or free for all one in Christ Jesus? Now, if, if they're Jews and then Gentiles, yeah, I mean, Paul seems to be making the point that there's not a distinction. Right. And, and, see, and that's another one of those passages where you just cannot, you can't get around that. If, you ha if, you, if you're looking at this and you say, okay, I want to look at the dispensational view, is it biblical? You cannot harmonize that. You cannot reconcile that with <laughs> numerous statements of Paul and others. We are one in Christ. We're not subordinate Christians. We will not be subordinate Christians. Uh, if we are in Christ, then there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, again, there are different roles. Some people take that and go to, uh, obviously, an extreme and and start saying, well, you know, it also says neither male nor female, so females can preach and uh, hold position in the eldership and things like that. That doesn't mean that there's not a difference in roles. But there are no subordinate Christians in the kingdom. You know, the elders aren't better Christians than somebody else just because they're elders. Deacons aren't, boy, you know, he, he is, he's just a notch above everybody else. He's a deacon. Preachers aren't a notch above anybody else. We are one in Christ, and we have different roles in the one body but we're all one in Christ. Better move through this. Uh, they say that millennium is going to be an age of peace and happiness um, with even the wild animals tamed. We talked about that just a moment ago. 
Satan will be bound but loosed at the end of the millennium for a time, bringing such evil that the Lord's people are almost overcome. Uh, you know, again, you've got a problem here because the Lord's on earth with them at that time. And he's almost overcome by the devil who's been released. Uh, and so here's Jesus with all his people and he's almost overcome. Uh, what kind of God are, the, are you going to serve if you believe this? A God who, who you know, sits there and has to struck. That's not the God of the Bible, folks. Satan is nothing. He has no challenge whatsoever for God. And so there's, there's not an almost overcome uh, biblically speaking, the Lord intervenes according to this and destroys the wicked with fire from heaven. And that's the end of the millennial period. And then you have resurrection, and I put in parentheses again, because again, this is our third resurrection. Uh, this time the unrighteous for judgment. Uh, some accept the present universe will be destroyed, others hold it will be renovated, becoming an eternal paradise. So here's your summation. Uh, there's your, your big main points of premillen dispensational premillennialism. So you see there, there's a lot to this, and as I said, it's, it's fan, fantastical, it's sensational. Uh, it involves a lot of imagination because there are things, some of this, there, there are, I mean, some of this you find the words in the Bible, but you don't find the concept at all. I mean, there, the words great and tribulation actually do appear together in the Bible. But it's not talking about what the dispensational premillennialists would have it to talk about at all. And, and we'll talk more about these details as we go through. But I want us to understand post-millennialism versus premillennialism versus amillennialism. And just to wrap it up for our class tonight, uh, I basically discussed this already, but amillennialism is not a formal theory. It's just a rejection, pretty much, of the post- or premillennial theory interpretation. Uh, amillennialists accept the references in, refer in Revelation uh, 20, about the thousand years, they just, they reject contrived interpretations of a symbolic passage. That's, that's the long and short of it. Uh, amillennialists find premillennialism and postmillennialism to be unbiblical. Uh, Paul talks about 2 Timothy 2.15, study or give diligence to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. When we handle aright the word of truth, you don't find the doctrine of postmillennialism you don't find the doctrine of premillennialism uh, anywhere in the Bible. And that's what we're going to, as we go along, we'll uh, unpack that a little bit more and look and see. The Bible just does not teach these things, and that's why we don't, uh, we don't hold to those. Sometimes people say, how come? I had people when I was a kid ask me sometimes at school, say, how come uh, you don't ever talk about the rapture? How come you don't believe in the rapture? Maybe they knew I didn't believe in that. And so that's what we're going to be looking at is why. It's not just an arbitrary decision. It's not just, well, that's what I was always taught. Mom and dad don't believe it, so I don't either. Uh, you know, my church, sometimes people use that expression. Y'all know I don't like that. It's the Lord's church. But uh, sometimes people say, well, at my church, we don't believe that, so I don't believe it either. Well, folks, with all due respect, that's a dumb reason. That's no reason at all. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I just want us to understand you, you have to have some conviction. And just saying, well, that's what I was always taught, or that's what mom and dad did, or that's what they believe, that's what, where I've always gone to church believes, that's not a reason at all. So I'm not going to stand before God one day with this congregation and the elders answering for me and saying, you know, here's Chad, and, and we told him not to believe that premillennial stuff, and, and he didn't believe it, and so on, on and he goes. No, I'm going to stand before God. I'm not going to stand there with my parents, and my parents say, we taught him, we taught him to reject that premillennialism, so he, he goes in, right, Lord? I'm going to stand before God. You're going to stand before God, and we're going to answer for ourselves. And so that's why we're looking at this and examining it in light of the Bible. Anything else? I was going to try to go a little bit uh, something else, but I, I'm going to save that for next week. We'll talk next week about, well, that was perfect timing. <laughs> we'll talk next week about... Uh, the right reading of Revelation, and hopefully if we have time, maybe even get into Revelation 20 and start unpacking this millennial uh, time period, this thousand years. Look at it, you know, literal thousand years versus figurative. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. We'll have our announcements in just a moment.
Just a few announcements. You asked to consult your bulletin in the screen for those that are on our prayer list. Are there any others that we should make specific mention of at this time? We welcome those who are visiting with us. We hope that you can come back and be with us very soon. There will be a youth devo after the evening service this coming Sunday the 28th at the home of Johnny and Melanie. And Gary and Jamie's group, too, will have their Brothers Keepers meeting Sunday week, January the 4th, after the morning worship service in the Fellowship Hall. It'll be a potluck lunch. Brother Chad. At the height of a political corruption trial, there was a prosecuting attorney, and he began to uh, attack the witness who was on the stand. He says, isn't it true that you accepted $5,000 to compromise this case? The witness just stood there, didn't say anything. And the lawyer, as, as they can tend to do, he became a little more agitated, and he said, isn't it true that you accepted $5,000 to compromise this case? And a witness was just kind of standing there and just kind of sort of twiddling his thumbs and uh, it kind of got to be awkward. And he, the lawyer was very perturbed and the, the judge leaned over and he said, sir, please answer the question. And the witness kind of startled. He said, oh, I thought he was talking to you. <laughs> I have the same trouble when I'm preaching. Everybody thinks you're talking to somebody else. And you know, sometimes as a preacher, I have that problem myself. Let's think about a passage in Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. What do we need to make right in our lives? What do you need to make right in your life? I need to be asking myself that question. You need to be asking yourself that question. Don't worry about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or Mr. so-and-so. It's so easy to say, that was a great sermon. I just wish so-and-so had been here to hear it. Even as preachers, we tend to think that sometimes. Well, I sure wish old so-and-so had been here to hear that. But you know what? I need it, and you need it if it's from the Word of God. What changes do we need to make in our lives? It's so easy to sit back and just kind of, as the witness did, just stare off into space and say, well, I thought he was talking to someone else. But when God speaks, he's speaking to you and to me. God calls us to leave sin and self and come to him, believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Savior of the world. He calls us to confess his name as Lord, be immersed in water to have our sins washed away, as the early, early folks did there in the first century, to become Christians, added by the Lord to his church. He calls us as Christians to follow him faithfully all the days of our lives. What changes do you need to make? What corrections do you need to make in your life? Again, don't worry about the other person. They'll stand before God on their own. They'll take care of themselves, and if not, they'll answer for that. But you and I will answer for ourselves. And so as we sing this song of invitation, let's ask ourselves the question, what do I need to make right? God's talking to me right now. What do I need to make right? And then make it right as we stand and sing to encourage you.
forward to seeing you all at Bible study Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of this song and then we'll have closing prayer. Savior, grant me rest in peace. Let my troubled dreaming cease. With the chiming midnight bell, teach my heart that all is well. I would seek thy service, Lord, leaning Our God in heaven, I thank you so much for this day that you have given us. I thank you for allowing us to come together and worship you in peace. And Father, I thank you for the church here at Bremen. I thank you for their willingness to serve you and worship you. I thank you for their hearts. And I pray that you would please continue to bless them always. I pray that you would guide our congregation and help us to grow and help us to grow closer to you. God, I thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us in this life. I thank you for your love and your patience, and I thank you for your son, Jesus. And I pray that you would help us to strive to be like him every day. I pray that you would help us in our daily lives and everything we do to give glory and praise to you. I pray that you would help us to, through our actions, let the world see you through us. I again thank you for all the things that you do for us, all your blessings and all your, your love and your patience with us. I pray that you would please continue to have that patience with us. I again thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen.